So we are starting a new series this morning. And uh, in addition to just being a teaching series on Sunday mornings, it's actually a, uh, a journey that we are inviting the entire body into over the next uh, six or seven weeks as we lead up to Easter. And so I want to take a few minutes this morning before we come to our teaching passage to, uh, to talk about this thing called Lent. And so hopefully you got one of these. Linda was referencing the bookmark that was probably in this, but just a little uh, guide. And uh, if you didn't get one of those, you can slip up your hand, and uh, one of our good-looking guys will uh, pass, or Kip will pass one of those to you. <laughs> so come on. <laughs> there it is. So I want to just run through this real quick with you. And um, for, for some of us, we've, uh, we've done Lent or things like that in the past. Maybe you grew up in a church tradition that observed the traditional Christian calendar. And uh, maybe it was a really good experience or maybe it was something that weirded you out. And so I want, to, want you to know that we're aware of that, that, um, that some of this stuff may come with some baggage for you guys, and, and that's okay. We want to give you room to uh, respond and participate however you need to. Um, but for others of us, and like me, I grew up in a, uh, in a church that didn't really acknowledge the historic Christian calendar and uh, seasons like Lent and Advent and different things. And so when I discovered it about 10 years ago or so, it was a really exciting thing, a really beautiful thing that helped not only draw me nearer into um, a kind of a sense of, of connectedness or groundedness, rootedness in the faith, that this isn't some latest, greatest trend or fad that we're jumping on board with, but following Jesus is something that people have been doing for thousands of years now, and uh, we get to be part of that story and part of that history. And so, um, so Lent, if you don't know, number one, is a six-week season in the Christian calendar prior to Easter. So uh, Lent compromises, uh, really the comprises of the 40, no, it doesn't compromise, um, it's comprised of the 40 days leading up to Easter. Now the math's a little funky, it actually, uh, on the calendar, it started this last Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, maybe you saw people going around with that stuff going on. Um, we're kind of beginning today with, uh, with the first Sunday of Lent, and if you kind of do the math up until April 5th, which is Easter, Lent actually doesn't include Sundays, and so the idea is that it's Monday through Saturday for those weeks leading up to Easter. Sunday is a mini Easter every week. In fact, all year long, that's why we worship on Sunday. It's a mini celebration, remembrance of Christ's resurrection. And so um, it's been going on for a long time, this thing Lent. And some of us may feel like maybe it's like a Catholic thing or something that we as Protestants don't engage. Lent was actually first formally discussed at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. Okay? So way, way back. And that's the formal discussion. Christ followers had already been practicing a season of prayer and fasting and preparation for Easter way before that. So 325, this is not a Catholic thing. This is a Christian thing and always has been. Just by way of context, the doctrine of the Trinity was also developed at the Council of Nicaea in 325. Okay, so not some weird trend that developed later when things got strange in church history, but this was from the very, very beginnings of the Christian faith, something that Christ followers participated in and found it helpful. So um, next, Lent's a time for spiritual growth. And so in the ancient church, Lent was a season for new Christians to be instructed for baptism and for believers caught in sin to focus on repentance. In time, Christians came to see Lent as a time to be reminded of their need for self-examination. And so it's, it's the idea that we are creating space for God, that we are setting aside these 40 or so days to ask God to examine our hearts, to f form the character and life of Christ in us more fully. We are setting aside time to be spiritual, spiritually disciplined. Because the reality is spiritual growth requires spiritual discipline. It's not something that just happens to us and we're kind of passive observers of it, but God invites us to partner with his spirit in our own sanctification, in our own formation. 
He invites us through disciplines like Linda talked about scripture. And over the next few weeks, you'll hear about prayer and solitude and other things like that. Active engagement in the formation of our own hearts and souls for God. And so this is a season that may look different in how we all engage, but the invitation at the basic level is would you set apart these 40 days to create space and to partner with the Spirit in taking responsibility for your own faith and asking God to change you, to shape you, to help you uh, become more and more of the person that he's called and created you to be. Okay, next is it's a time to create space for God through fasting. And so um, we're going to talk this morning about a passage in Matthew 4 where Jesus goes out into the wilderness, led by the Holy Spirit, to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. And it was 40 days of fasting where he was essentially consecrating himself uh, to the Father. And Lent is really based on that season that Jesus uh, embarked in, and it's an invitation for us to identify with Christ in that. And so um, kind of the tradition and thing that if you don't know anything about Lent, you know this, is that it's typically a season of fasting. And in the Bible, when it talks about fasting, it's always referring to food. Okay, there's They're not talking about fasting from Facebook or whatever else in the Bible, obviously. Um, And so originally, fasting was a discipline that had to do with food. But over the years, lots of Christ followers have found it helpful to also apply the practice of fasting to other areas of life, to other comforts and pleasures of uh, of kind of normal living, and to abstain for a season, once again, in order to create space for God. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit more um, in, in depth as we go on. But finally then, Lent is a season of preparation. And so a few weeks ago I mentioned how none of us ever really have Easter on our radar because it's like following this strange lunar calendar, changes every year. And so it tends to sneak up on us. And it's a bummer because Easter is the time where we as Christians uh, have a reason to really celebrate, to really party well, to really get excited and pay attention to the good news of Christ's resurrection from the dead. And so we don't want Easter to sneak up on us and kind of just, oh, I guess it's Easter and then move on to the next thing. But we actually want to prepare as a community to celebrate Easter Sunday really well. Along with that, on the back of your uh, Is this a pamphlet? I don't know what this is. This paper. On the back of your paper, there's uh, uh, the info about our Good Friday and Easter services. They'll both be held right here this year, Friday night the 3rd, and then Sunday morning the 5th. And so kind of seeing those as two sides of the same coin. Like, you can't have resurrection without death, right? The good news becomes really good when you understand how bad the bad news is. And so Entering into Good Friday together will also help prepare us to celebrate Easter. Okay, so that's a little bit about what Lent is. Uh, Next, Lent is not. Lent is not a biblical requirement. Okay, so any of us that have radar for legalism or ritualism ritualism or empty religion, maybe we're kind of weirded out by, you know, this whole thing. And we just want to be honest, like, you don't have to do this. You don't have to. There's no judgment. If you, for whatever reason, choose to abstain from abstaining, um, <laughs> choose to fast from fasting, that's fine. But, um, but, but it's a cool thing. It's a great invitation. And again, it's rooted in church history. And um, I would say for me personally, it's been one of the most meaningful practices in the formation of my own faith and love. Um, over the last 10 years, I, I love this season. And I'm excited to, to invite you into it. But you don't have to do it. So that's, uh, that's all I'll say about that. And then finally, on the, in that note too, Lent is not a way that we can earn more of God's love and grace, okay? So some of us think about doing something like this that's not a biblical requirement and go, well, it must be legalistic. It must be something that uh, says if we do this, then God will love us more. And what I'm going to talk about in a moment is that that's is actually the opposite, of what this is all about. We are not doing this fasting, spiritual discipline, Lent thing in order to earn more of God's love and grace, as if we could, but we're actually doing it in response to the love and grace that God's already shown us through Christ. So we're not doing it to be loved, we're doing it because we are loved. And uh, I'll help make more sense of that in a moment. So um, if you go through the uh, fasting stuff, I won't go through that line by line, 
But these are basically, if you're new to the discipline of fasting, then these are kind of just some, some suggestions or ideas to get you going. Um, a Daniel fast, a specific fast, a solidarity fast, where you eat rice and beans along with many of our brothers and sisters around the, around the world. A uh, liquid fast, all kind of different um, variations of food fasting, and then some other types of fast, media and music, social media and internet, self-indulgence, or maybe instead of a discipline of abstinence, a discipline of engagement, something that you would uh, add to your life for these next 40 days. And so, so maybe those, some of those will give you an idea. Um, for, for many of us, because of our job or health or diet or whatever, this may not be a good idea to uh, just stop eating for a couple months. I get that. Um, and I would say in the important notes, like if you do have questions about the health or whatever, like this shouldn't be harmful to your body. Okay, so don't, I, uh, I shouldn't tell that story. So, um, <laughs> So if you are going to do a significant food fast, the second note there is to ease your way in and out, right? So I'm not saying I've done this, but a guy I know once did a 40-day liquid fast and then broke the fast at Red Robin, right? That's a very, very bad idea. I'm not saying I did that, um, but don't ask, <laughs> don't ask my wife. So um, anyways, let me give you a couple more uh, Things. Here's why I would say it's important um, for you to think about participating in Lent. Number one is that Lent strengthens our no muscles. Okay? So we know that ultimately a life of following Jesus is a life saying yes to him. Right? Yes to obeying his commands. Yes to receiving and giving his love. Yes to believing the good news of the gospel, of the kingdom. It's a life of saying yes to the promptings of the Spirit and the voice of God. But in order to say yes to him, at the same time, we're also saying no, right? We're saying no to temptation. We're saying no to sin. We're saying no to pride, to selfishness. And in, in practical everyday life, as a Christ follower, I'm saying no to that lustful thought or to that additional drink or to that bitterness or whatever it is. And so... To be a Christian is to say yes to Christ and say no to the flesh, to the world, to the devil. And Lent, and particularly the discipline of fasting, is an incredibly helpful way to build our no muscles. For 40 days, you're saying no to that meal or that food or that whatever. And you'll find that at the end of the 40 days, your no muscle, if you will, is much stronger. Right? That that impulse to say yes to Christ and no to uh, sin is, you're, you're doing pretty well in that sense. And that's honor, honoring and glorifying to him. And so I find it incredibly helpful. I, uh, as I go through Lent, as I go through a season of fasting, I find that it's much easier to say yes to Jesus. So uh, next thing is that Lent teaches us, huh, there it is. Those got out of out of whack. Sorry about that. Lent teaches us to suffer well, which sounds like a lot of fun, right? <laughs> um, the truth is, one of the promises we have from God in Scripture, he doesn't promise that we're going to be rich or that we're, we're going to have a sweet house or a sweet car or everything's going to be good. One of the promises is that there will be suffering. That if we're going to follow Jesus and Jesus' life was one marked by suffering, then we also can expect to suffer, sometimes directly because of our faith, and sometimes because that's part of what it is to be human. And for many of us, especially living in the relative comfort of the West, suffering is such an ancient or such a distant idea that when it comes upon us, when tragedy or difficulty or disappointment comes, it's like it's shocking, and we don't know how to suffer well. So Lent is actually a season of voluntary suffering, where we are willing to practice suffering, where we are willing to live with some discomfort, to live with some pain, to live with some tension within ourselves, and ultimately how to find our place in God in the meantime. And so, so Lent's a season that teaches us to suffer well so that when things do go bad, we are able to, as the Bible invites us, to actually give thanks to rejoice in suffering 
And uh, I found it really helpful. And finally this, Lent exposes our idols. You'll be really surprised at the thing that if you choose to, to abstain from something or give something up, you'll be really surprised at what happens within your heart. That all of a sudden, even if it's not a thing that was really central to your life before, it's like you're going to begin craving it. And you're going to begin missing it and wanting it more than you realize. And you're actually going to realize, especially if you do a significant food-related fast, you're going to realize how much of life revolves around satisfying the appetites of our body and that we are actually controlled by those as opposed to being controlled by the Spirit of God. And so um, anticipate some grumpiness, I would say, and anticipate that in addition to whatever physical, you know, kind of wrestling and hungering you're, you're experiencing, that, that all of that is actually tied into what's happening at a deeper level within you spiritually. And so this is super embarrassing, but when I fast significantly from food, um, within a few days, I'll find myself up late at night Googling pictures of burgers and ribs <laughs> on my computer and finding these big, juicy, beautiful pictures and then, you know, deleting my search history. Like some guys look at porn. I don't look at porn. I look at pizza and hot wings. Isn't that weird? <laughs> like, that's so messed up, isn't it? Because for me, and maybe for some of you guys too, like food isn't just food, right? Food is comfort, food is security, food is pleasure. And, uh, and all of a sudden, when you take that away in a significant way, it, it begins to expose those things in our lives, idols, that occupy the place that only Jesus should, right? So, does this sound like fun? <laughs> So um, that's, that's kind of the lowdown, and, uh, and again, I would, I would encourage you, um, Lent officially started Wednesday, but today we're kind of calling us into it today, and so I would encourage you to think about starting tomorrow in, in, some, in some way, and to ask God what it is that he would call you to say no to for uh, 40 days leading up to Easter, so that you can say yes to his formative work in your life. So as we uh, do that as a church... Each week, we'll have a teaching moment where uh, some, of the, some of the teaching team members will call us into spiritual disciplines. And then Ken and I will be walking uh, through this series called Walking with God. And um, that's, that's kind of the basic idea. So if you have more questions, shoot me an email and, um, or whatever. I'd, I'd love to talk with you more about this if you're struggling. So Sound good? Cool. All right. So let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 4 where we will start our series this morning with the story of the temptation of Christ. I just, I want to read the first 11 verses. Familiar story, but if you haven't noticed, I like to read large chunks of scripture that way, if the sermon sucks, at least you still hear from God. So, <laughs> Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. It's not sarcasm. He actually was, surprisingly. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it's also written, don't put your Lord, the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. There's a... Uh, sociological term that I came across recently called hyperreality. 
And uh, it's a phrase that, it's a term that sociologists are using to describe the world we now live in as modern Westerners. And essentially, it could be defined as we have now created a world for ourselves that's even better than the real thing. That we live and are, and are constantly being invited to occupy a world that's better than reality. And so hyperreality has basically three components. Um, Radical individualism, mass media consumption, and rampant consumerism. So most of us live in this place so deeply that we don't even know that we do. It's the water that we swim in. So radical individualism is basically the idea that we are now told that we are the most important person in the world. That the universe revolves around us. And uh, there's a reason. It's called an iPhone, right? Right? This is now the thing that solidifies my place at the center of the solar system. And uh, this plays out in all different kinds of ways, not just in our technology, but in the way that we move around the world. And so Bend, super, uh, super desirable destination, right? Place that everybody wants to live, and if they could find a job, they would move here. Um, here's what I want to ask. How many of you moved to Bend? How many of you got here today? Because you were asking, how can I give to the city of Bend? How can I be a blessing to this city? How can I invest in this city and help it to do really well so that humans can flourish here? Or did we move here saying, what can Bend give me? What does this city have to offer me? How can I gain and grow from being here. See, it's just built into how we think about life, how we move through the world. We have bought into the lie that the world revolves around us. Radical individualism. Secondly, mass media consumption. So here's the weird thing, that we can compare lives with each other without even knowing each other, right? Through social media and other things, I can get on and see your profile, search through your pictures and your posts, and I begin to get an idea about the life that you live and who you are. Now the problem is, what do we post on social media? All of life's best moments, right? The amazing vacations we take, the cutest pictures of our kids, the best looking meals that we eat, and I read through your feed and I see all that and I'm going, man, what an amazing life. And I start to get jealous of you. And you're posting that you're like climbing some mountain or rafting some river, and it's like Thursday afternoon. And I'm going, why are you doing that on a Thursday? (laughs) But of course, nobody works in Bend anyway, so that's just how it happens. But all of a sudden, I begin to get jealous. (laughs) And it's just, it's the weirdest thing, because we all know that life has ups and downs and beautiful, ornate gourmet meals and bowls of instant oatmeal, but nobody's going to post that on Instagram right? Nobody's going to post a selfie of, look how I gained 20 pounds. <laughs> Even though, if we were honest, that would how it would be for most of us. And so, social, social media and mass media in general has caused us to live in a world, now you're starting to get it, that is better than reality. Okay? So, you flip through the magazines, you see the beautiful airbrushed models, and think, man, I want to look like that. And the truth is, those same airbrushed models are looking through and going, man, I want to look like that too. But we're assuming it's reality. And so, I mean, don't even get started on reality TV, right? Like, it's a thing. It's a huge thing. We have reality TV shows, which would lead us to think that if we watch those shows, we're getting a glimpse of what the real world is like. But the truth is, all the shows are about people that live in very unreal worlds, right? Rich and famous and crazy, and they're doing all this incredible stuff, and we're going, oh, that's reality. And it's not, and we begin to, be able to lose the ability to tell the difference. Now, if they wanted to actually make a real reality TV show, it would actually be about people who sit at home watching reality TV shows, <laughs> right? But that's not actually going to sell real well. So... <laughs> You see what I'm saying? Like, the the lines are getting blurry. We live in a world now that's better than the real thing. And finally, rampant consumerism. So we want what we want. We want it now. We're expected, we're exposed to thousands of ads every day. 
and they basically all have the same message. Your life stinks, and it always will until you buy this product or service. That's what we're told over and over again, that you will never be what you want to be. You'll never have the life that you dream of until you spend on this stuff. And so we are now given an identity as consumers. And we believe the lie. And advertisers are genius at this because they know that they're not actually selling cars or beer or clothes or gadgets. What are they actually selling? They're selling happiness and power and significance and intimacy and acceptance. And their product or service is just a means to give us those things that we really want. And so we become consumers. And the truth is that that actually begins to sneak into the church as well. Christopher Wright in The Mission of God wrote, we ask, where does God fit into the story of my life? But the Bible asks a different question. Where does my life fit into the story of God's mission? You see how that can get flipped upside down really quick? I assume that the world revolves around me, that I'm looking for products and services and experiences that are going to enhance my life and give me, make me the me I want to be. And maybe God can be one of those accessories that enhances my life. And the story of the Bible is completely upside down from that. That God, the creator, redeemer, sustainer of the universe, is clearly the one at the center of it all. And the question we should be asking is, Where's my place in his story? What kind of me does he want me to be? What kind of life, where does he want me to live? How can I be part of who he is and what he's doing? When we come to Matthew 4, there's this really uh, interesting connection between the temptations that Jesus faced and the world that we live in today. I think they'd be applicable to all humans at all times, but I think it's unique that there's essentially three temptations that the, that the devil puts before Christ. The temptation for appetite, temptation of approval, and the temptation of control. And so, in the first one, Jesus has been fasting for 40 days, and surprise, surprise, he's hungry. And Satan comes along and offers him bread, but not exactly. Satan doesn't actually just wave bread in front of Jesus and say, hey, do you want some? Instead, he suggests that Jesus uses his divine power to remove his hunger, to turn these rocks into loaves. Here's, here's what one author said. But Jesus wasn't out in the wilderness for private spiritual experiences. He was out there representing Adam and Israel. He was on a mission as a corporate, as a corporate person, a community. In that reality, Satan sought to lure Jesus, the community, by an appeal to self-interest. Take care of your immediate self-focused needs first before accomplishing the mission. Be foremost about self-interest and self-focus. So all of a sudden, you and I find ourselves in the story. I've never been tempted to do a magic trick and turn rocks into bread but I am tempted every day to be a self-focused, self-interested person and to do whatever I can to satisfy the appetites and the cravings that control me. And what we see in Jesus is that Jesus does what Adam was supposed to do and Jesus ultimately does what Israel was supposed to do. So we just spent six weeks In lessons from the desert, 40 years, Israel wanders the desert, and now Jesus shows up 40 days in the wilderness. And the whole time we saw Israel out there doubting God, denying God, building false gods and idols to worship instead of him. And so Jesus shows up and not only does what Adam was supposed to do, but he becomes the true picture of Israel, an embodiment of all of God's people saying no to the devil and yes to the Father. Second temptation is for approval. So pick the most crowded place 
in the most populated city, the, the focal point of that community's life. And Satan says, I can make you famous. I can make your name great. I can make people want you and want to be around you and want to love you. And again, he writes, the temptation is to shape and mold our reputation. In Jesus' temptation, Satan lured Jesus with the promise of great credibility and convincing spectacle. Jesus could have been the most lauded leader in Palestine. After all, who wouldn't believe in Jesus if he would just follow all the Roman or Sadducee rules for greatness standing on the temple, confirming its legitimacy, having even the angels rescued him? Forget all this talk of shame and the cross. The Sadducees may even give you a degree. The Pharisees might even introduce you to their friend Caesar. But Jesus had none of it. That was the way of death. And so Jesus denies the temptation to be controlled by his need for the approval of others. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves in that story. We find ourselves asking, how often are the choices I make, the values I hold, the life I live, shaped by that deep, lonely, desperate cry that asks other people, will you accept me? Will you include me? Will you love me? Will you esteem me? And it goes deep, and it begins to shape everything. And there's this vision that we have in Christ of the freedom from our need for approval. I'll talk about how that gets neat, met in a, in a moment. But it's a beautiful invitation. Can you imagine going through life not having to worry what other people think about you? And not giving in to that temptation on a regular basis. And then finally, the need for control. Satan tempts him and says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, in verse 8, if you'll bow down and worship me. Jesus is offered by Satan the platform to be the ruler of the world. Now, stop with me for a moment. Why would that be a bad thing for Jesus to rule the world? That actually sounds like a really good thing. Because we know that when Jesus is king, heaven comes to earth. And sick people are made well. And sad people are given hope. And dead people are raised back to life when Jesus is king. And Satan's like, why don't you just do that? You can do whatever you want. You can have power and dominion and control over the entire universe. You can make the world however you want it to be. I'm going, huh? Why wouldn't he do that? Well, the condition attached is if you will bow down and worship me. So Jesus could have been king of the world, but he would have also been a Satan worshiper. That's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> right? So clearly, Jesus isn't just power hungry as he comes to be our saving king. But he comes in incredible loyalty and faithfulness to his father and to the mission that he's been sent on. So Jesus resists all three of those temptations. And the author writes, you will be tempted exactly as Jesus was because Jesus was being tempted exactly as we are. You will be tempted with consumption, security, and status. You'll be tempted to provide for yourself, to protect yourself, and to exalt yourself. And at the core of these three is the common impulse to cast off the fatherhood of God. So if we were to ask, what is it that empowered Jesus to resist these incredibly deep and authentic temptations... And I'll just go on record and say, I don't think Jesus was acting and pretending to be tempted. I think he was fully human and was authentically tempted the way that you and I are. What is it that allowed him to say no to sin, to say no to self, to say no to the devil, and to say yes to God? Well, if you look immediately before this story, in Matthew chapter 3, 
there's something significant that happens right before Jesus goes into the wilderness, isn't there? Look at the last few verses of Matthew 3 and verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do so to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, listen to this, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, and with him I'm well pleased. Then verse 1, then Jesus was led by the Spirit. So you get the flow of the narrative. Jesus enters the wilderness led by the Spirit immediately after his baptism. And amongst all the things, there's theological layers, biblical layers that we can dig into and ask why would Jesus, who's perfect and sinless, need to be baptized? But among all the things we would need to know this morning, that Jesus' baptism is the moment where the Father publicly pronounces his love, acceptance, pleasure, and affirmation upon his Son. So what's happening? Jesus is being named by his father. He is being accepted. He's being affirmed in his identity as the one who the father loves. And all of the sudden, if Jesus actually believes the father's words that I am your son, I am loved, and you are pleased by me, if Jesus were to actually believe that and then go out into the desert, you see how all of Satan's temptations lose all of their power. Because Jesus is no longer going through life looking for love, looking for acceptance, looking to belong or to have control, but he is now named and marked and identified as one who's beloved by his Father. It's an incredible thing. The good news of the gospel, in part, is that we now, because of the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, are actually, identif- are actually invited to become one with Jesus. To share in his suffering and share in his death that we may share in his resurrection and share in his glory that we are invited now to identify with him in the sense that what is true about him in God's eyes now becomes true about us. Not because we gave up coffee for Lent or because we didn't cuss for 40 days or because we gave up social media or whatever. None of that solidifies a place as those being loved and graced by God. But simply out of God's love and grace, he says, What's true of my son is now true of those who are in him. There's a famous book, a Christian classic called Knowledge of the Holy that I've read multiple times and think is an important book. And he starts with the line, the most important thing about a man is what comes into his mind when he thinks about God. Um, I'm going to respectfully disagree because I actually believe that there's something even more important than that. I get what he's saying and it's true, but there's something even more important. The most important thing about you isn't what comes into your mind when you think about God. It's what comes into God's mind when he thinks about you. And all the thoughts that I have about God, if any of them are going to be true, they're simply going to be a reflection or a response to what God thinks about me. And so, let me ask you this. If you could describe how God feels about you in one word, what would it be? If you're honest. Don't give a Sunday school answer, but if you're honest. For many of us, the first impulse might be negative. He's disappointed. He's disgusted. 
He's indifferent. But if the gospel's true, and if we really are invited to share in the life, death, resurrection, and glory of Christ, it means that the Father feels the same way about you and me as he does about his son, Jesus. And he would say to us, you are my child whom I love. With you, I'm well pleased. Not, I will be pleased if you behave really well. Not, whom I will love if you do Lent. (laughs) But you, as you sit there today, with your sketchy past, with your idolatrous heart, with your weak spirit, I love you. I'm pleased by you. (laughs) That would change everything if we believed it. And so beneath this whole story, if we're to look at it as a way of following Jesus into the desert, following Jesus into a season of seeking God's identity, we find that it's really not so much about what you're giving up for Lent, what you're abstaining from, what you're saying no to, but it's learning to live into those words and removing all the stuff that we look to instead of God for that. All the ways we tend to get our needs met, to gain approval, to gain love. God's saying, I want to be all of that for you. And so there's incredible freedom that we see in Christ that's now given to us. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you have come to us in your son, that you have invited us to be named by you, to have all of our needs met by you. And I pray for myself and for my brothers and sisters here as we embark on this journey towards Easter, that you would help us to hear and believe the good news that you would help us to find our place in you, in your story, in your mission. And we thank you that you are a good and gentle and faithful and just God, that we can trust our hearts and our lives to you, that as we go through this season and open ourselves up for self-examination, for the exposure of our, our idols, we thank you that we can trust you, that you're not going to trap us, that you're not going to hurt us, but that you will be faithful to handle the consequences of our obedience. And so, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to lead us through this desert as you led your Son. In Jesus' name, amen.